Now let us look into the final segment of our module, the concept of e-governance. First of all, let us try to understand what e-governance is. So e uh, in the e-governance stands for electronics. So e-governance as the name suggests is the application of information and communication technology for providing government services. Why do we need e-governance? Uh, there are a lot of reasons why we might uh, need to switch to e-governance. Firstly, uh, it can help in a better delivery of uh, government services to citizens. Secondly, it can improve the interactions between businesses and the industry. Thirdly, it can empower citizens by facilitating access to information. Fourthly, it can help in making the government more efficient and more importantly, it can usher in lesser corruption, more transparency, more convenience, all of this at reduced costs. With e-governance, uh, the government can save a lot of money that might otherwise be spent on uh, resources that are needed for providing services to people. This might be stationery, this might be machinery, the number of personnel who are required for managing these affairs, etc. Uh, another advantage is that of transparency all the information would be accessible to people at their disposal which makes the government more transparent and uh, when the government becomes more transparent it becomes more accountable as well once uh, citizens have access to the information which is provided by the government they can hold the government accountable for its actions uh, moreover once things become automated it's uh, easier for the government to process the information and deliver services more efficiently. It takes lesser time and there would be fewer errors while government renders its functions, making it uh, efficient overall. Lastly, it facilitates citizens to be more proactive in engaging with how governance is being carried out in the country. They can interact more closely with the government, making them more cooperative. They can also be more active and aware citizens which makes them capable of advocating for the rights they have as citizens and the duties that the government owes to them. Uh, even though all of these ad advantages are there, e-governance comes with its own set of challenges. For the rural population, the accessibility of internet is an issue. Therefore, they might not be able to make use of the facilities offered by e-governance in a fruitful manner. Secondly, uh, there is this low literacy rates in most parts of our country, which makes it uh, difficult for people to navigate through e-governance or on their own. So they might need the help of other people. Maybe the government officers themselves will have to assist uh, these uh, people, illiterate people especially, to uh, how to go about uh, accessing these services through technology. So this might make the whole system seem redundant. Language may be a significant barrier. Many people may not be under, uh, able to understand the system if these services are offered to them in English or in a regional language that is not their own language. So uh, a language may be a considerable barrier in e-governance. Uh, another aspect that we need to bear in mind is that when government becomes technology centered, we always need to be cautious about the loss or leakage of data. If there is a breach of sensitive uh, data of the citizens, it can have very uh, many dangerous consequences. So e-governance comes with its own set of advantages and the challenges. We have something called the National e-governance plan of 2006, which formulates the framework for ushering in e-governance in our country. Its vision statement itself makes it clear that it wants the government services to be accessible to the common man through common service delivery outlets. So this it claims will bring about more transparency, efficiency and reliability at affordable costs. So what is this common service delivery outlets? This is uh, found in a three tier architecture. So at one end we have the common service centers. So these are the uh, outlets through which e-governance services are made available to the citizens. So there will be many common service centers in your locality. If you go to your nearest common service center, you can uh, approach the common service center for 
uh, getting your applications, uh, getting your renewals, getting your registrations, etc. done. They, the personnel sitting there in the common service center would be able to process your applications through uh, online facilities. Now, there needs to be a uh, infrastructure which will facilitate the common service centers to provide the services uh, to the citizens. So, this infrastructure is provided by the government. This may be in the form of computer, logistics, technology, network, etc. So, whatever infrastructure goes into it, that is termed as the common and support infrastructure. This infrastructure will help share information between the government and the citizens through the delivery of services through common service centers. Now, what are the services that are sought to be provided through e-governments? They have titled it as mission mode projects. This is nothing but the services that are sought to be provided to the citizens. So this may be in the form of uh, banking services or maybe uh, getting your applications done. Uh, it may be in the uh, agricultural sector. So there may be different mission mode projects in each sector. There may be a separate uh, mission mode project for the healthcare sector, for the agricultural sector, for the banking sector, etc. Each of this mission mode project will be implemented by and uh, spearheaded by the concerned ministry. So for the ministry of agriculture will be taking care of the all the mission mode projects that are there related to the agricultural sector. So uh, that is how uh, the national e-governance plan uh, facilitates e-governance in our country. So how does uh, this infrastructure work? First of all, there is the Department of Information Technology which will create this common and support infrastructure and it will also lay down the standards and policy guidelines that are to be followed. Then uh, as I said before, the mission mode projects, each of those are uh, owned by and led by and implemented by the concerned ministries. The state governments may adopt certain state-specific uh, projects also for implementing it through e-governance. Uh, one uh, particular example for this would be uh, the system of Bhumi uh, that is prevalent in Karnataka. This is an e-governance initiative uh, for digitizing land records uh, in the state of Karnataka. So this is one uh, such example of a state-specific e-governance project. But there are uh, limitations to the number of e-governance projects that can be implemented through uh, state level. Otherwise, uh, most of the e-governance initiatives will be uh, at the central level. Now, it is the planning commission as well as the ministry of finance which allocates uh, funds uh, for uh, the smooth functioning of these e-governance. And the cabinet committee on economic affairs uh, takes the policy level decisions for each of these projects. Uh, the uh, there is an apex committee which is headed by the cabinet secretary which will oversee uh, this program to provide inputs uh, from a policy perspective as well as uh, implementation perspective. So this is the overall architecture uh, that has been envisaged under the national e-governance plan for uh, ushering in e-governance in India. There are a lot of e-governance initiatives which have been taken in our country and which have been proved to be very successful. Uh, we have already looked into common service centers. These are the go-to places if you want to get uh, your online applications or renewals done. These are available uh, in most of the localities. Then we have something called Umang. So Umang is a platform which will let you access many different kinds of services that are offered by the central government the state government and even the local bodies all in one platform. And the advantage of Umang is that it is available in many regional languages. Uh, DigiLocker is something that most of us uh, will be very familiar with. This is one platform that will allow you to access, download and store uh, your government documents like Aadhaar card, Voters ID card, PAN card, etc. So uh, the Documents which are stored in DigiLocker, if you uh, show them uh, to a government official or if you show them for any identification purpose, you need not produce the original copy of the document. The copy in the DigiLocker would be sufficient. It will be considered as, as authentic as the physical copy of your certificate. 
uh, UPI or the Unified Payments Interface uh, might be an app that most of us will be using on a daily basis. This is an app uh, that will help you make uh, money transfers in a cashless mode. We also have an interesting initiative called MyGo. So MyGo is a platform which will help citizens to uh, provide their own inputs uh, for governance. So the citizens can make posters, citizens can submit their vision, their ideas for how the country should be run to the government. So the government will be in a position to understand what are the citizens expectations, what are their ideas, what are their visions, uh, which is made available to them through this platform. Meri Pehchan is uh, another initiative uh, which will help uh, users access a lot of services with a single set of credentials. Uh, we also have something called Diksha. Diksha is an app that has been uh, targeted for the teachers uh, to help them bring about digital infrastructure for a better uh, teaching facilities in the country. Coven is an app that all of us have used uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So all of these are uh, e-governance initiatives that have proven to be very successful and very helpful uh, in navigating for uh, the citizens. Uh, these are only some of the initiatives. There are a lot of state-specific initiatives also. There are a lot of Pan-India initiatives uh, that have been uh, launched by the government that are being uh, proposed to be launched, etc. So uh, this is just to give you a snapshot of the status of e-governance in our country. Very recently, we have come up with a policy called the National Data Governance Framework Policy. This, as the title suggests, is to uh, understand how the data that is collected through e-governance initiatives is to be processed, stored and handled with. So this policy, although it's not binding, uh, gives an exhaustive set of guidelines which can be useful in understanding how to deal with this data. Uh, it enumerates the best case scenario uh, of how to go about uh, in managing this data set. So it proposes to set up an Indian Data Management Office. This Indian Data Management Office would be set up under the Digital India Corporation functioning under the Ministry of Electronics and Information and Technology. So this Indian Data Management Office will formulate the rules that are required for accessing data, for using the data and it will develop the circumstances in which the data will have to be disclosed. And uh, this uh, Indian Data Management Office is also expected to come up with something called the Indian Datasets Program. So under the Indian Datasets Program, what is envisaged is that the data that is collected from citizens by government entities, that will be depersonalized and it will be anonymized so that the data won't be, uh, the data won't enable us to track the persons from which we have sourced the data. So this uh, non-personal and anonymized data will be collected and uh, retained for uh, facilitating governance purposes. So uh, this Indian data sets program is something that will be implemented by the Indian data management office. Uh, so this uh, I hope gives you a snapshot of the e-governance uh, system in our country. With that we have come to an end of this module. Uh, in this module we have looked into various constitutionally set up authorities and bodies and the idea of e-governance. I hope you are able to understand and appreciate the nitty gritties which are involved uh, in the constitutional authorities and the bodies. Uh, I hope it. I hope this session has been useful to you. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.